All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our last speaker series installment in the Homegrown Scientist speaker series. Um, we are here today with Ashley and Rosario, um, who were both very involved in AWS uh, while they were in programs at UNM. So I'm really excited to have them here today. Um, if you're not familiar with AWS, we are a student group, uh, sorry, our name is Advancing Women in Science. And um, we're a student group uh, at UNM. And I will put our uh, contact information and um, email address and um, social media information into the chat in a minute here. Um, so if you're not on the listserv already, feel free to send us an email and we'll get you on the listserv. Um, this speaker series has been sponsored by the um, anthropology department, biology department, psychology department, and earth and planetary studies at UNM, um, as well as AWS. And um, I am not going to spend too much time introducing Ashley and Rosario um, because they're going to spend a lot of time introducing themselves. So um, I will turn it over to you. Ashley, go ahead and kick us off. Hi, yeah, so uh, my name is Ashley. Um, I got my bachelor's in science in computer science and psychology from UNM in 2019. And I just received my master's in computer science in December of 2020. Um, I now work as a research and development computer scientist at Sandia National Labs and am a subject matter expert um, in blockchain. Uh, technology. Um, and those are all of my accomplishments. And now I'm going to tell you how it was a shit journey to get there. Um, <laughs> so I didn't start at UNM. I'm actually from Oklahoma. Um, I was born and raised in Muskogee, Oklahoma, which is kind of a small town in the middle of nowhere um, with like very little resources and just like uh, an interesting place to live. Um, and so I graduated near the top of my class, but it was kind of a big fish, small pond kind of situation. Uh, um, and so I graduated and then I went to Oklahoma State University, which is one of the larger state universities in Oklahoma. They're very big into football. I'm not. Uh, I started as a mechanical engineer um, in my first semester and I took a couple of classes and I, learned during that semester that I had a really um, big mental disability um, that I had just been kind of living with through high school and was like fine because the coursework wasn't difficult. I didn't actually have to do a lot of work. Um, and so I was able to like just scoot by and like not um, deal with the fact that there was something going on. Um, my first sort of like wake up call to this was I had a midterm in my engineering design course that I, um, the night before I took that mid was supposed to take that midterm, spoiler, didn't take it, um, had taken a anti-anxiety medication because I was still sort of figuring out how to manage my illness. Um, and I like slept through all of my alarms. I slept through my roommate banging on my door. I didn't wake up until really late in the evening. Um, and I woke up and um, I texted my friend at the time, Thomas, who uh, was in the class with me uh, and was kind of like, hey, uh, I didn't make that midterm today. I think I'm gonna have to drop out of engineering design uh, or I might just have to fail the class. Um, and Thomas was like, I, I don't think that's necessary. Like, I think that like the professor of that class seems like a normal person who would be, who would be chill. Like, let's go talk to him. Um, and I didn't do any of the talking because I had yet to learn how to self advocate for myself. Um, and so Thomas dragged me up to the front of the class by the hood of my coat. And was like, you're gonna, you're gonna talk to this professor. And then I didn't talk to the professor and then Thomas did all the talking. Uh, and then the professor was like, it sounds like you probably have 
a, a condition that is like relevant to the disability resource center do you know what that is and i was like i've never heard of the disability resource center and like i'm not disabled i'm just like i'm broken like i i don't deserve help uh and so he was like well uh, let's go um and so he walked us over to the disability resource center um, and I worked with them and I was able to retake my midterm, not for any rules. It was just because that professor was really nice and was like, well, you showed up and you told us, well, I didn't tell them what was wrong, but Thomas told them what was wrong. Um, and I retook that midterm and I worked with Thomas a lot to sort of help with my other classes because I was struggling everywhere. It was not just this one class. Um, and I ended up doing okay that semester and uh, moved, moved sort of on. Uh, and then I started trying to take calculus, which is a big uh, class that any engineer or uh, computer scientist has to take, um, as, as well as other sciences, but those are the ones I'm familiar with. Um, and I could not cut it. Um, I failed Calc 1 and Calc 2 twice, uh, or no, I failed Calc 1 once, I got a C once, and then the UNM computer science department requires that you get a B minus in Calc 1. So I had to take that a third time. And then I failed Calc 2 twice in the past, the last time I took it. And that's really demoralizing. Um, and that's really a thing that like took me a lot of work to realize that it was okay that I had failed those classes and that failing those classes didn't mean that I didn't get to be what I wanted to be. Um, and thankfully, I finally took it with a professor who was like understanding and wasn't like, well, you're just going to have to get over it and memorize all of these equations and like know how to do uh, simple fractions, even though like your brain doesn't work that way. We're just going to need you to be able to divide along with doing all of this other very complicated math. Like we're going to need you to divide on paper, which takes you a ton of time. Um, and so passing those classes was probably the biggest hurdle in my undergrad. It's something that a lot of the time I spent being like, well, I guess maybe I don't need to be an engineer. I'll just become a therapist. They don't have to do math. I, ha I have the psych background to do that. That would be fine. But that's not really what I wanted to do. Uh, and that sort of drove me to be very, very passionate about disability access and like understanding that people learn things differently and also wanting to burn the UNM math department to the ground. Um, <laughs> very, <laughs> I have a very strong feeling on that. Um, and yeah, so I, once I had passed those classes, I was sort of kind of like, well, I, I could probably cut this, like the computer science classes are okay. Um, and I became a computer science tutor, which was very overwhelming because I was the only, I was the first female computer science tutor in many years. Um, and at the time I was the only female computer science tutor. And a lot of people didn't like th that I was a tutor and didn't really want tutoring from me. Um, and then another subset of people really liked that I was a tutor and really wanted tutoring from me. <laughs> and so that was a very, a uh, weird experience. Also the computer science department kind of uh, screwed up that semester and like had a graduate student who didn't know how to teach or didn't know a language uh, teach that language. Um, and so I spent a lot of time with, I don't know, like 30 students in the computer science lab every time I was tutoring, uh, just needing help because the teacher who was my advisor at the time was not very good and she's not very good at teaching. Uh, and the TA was not very helpful. Um, and so that was very stressful. Um, and during that semester, I actually, that was my first sort of encounter working at Sandia. So I had applied to an internship on like a whim uh, just because I was like, well, this sounds cool and I probably won't get it because I definitely don't meet any of these qualifications, but like I could swing it. Um, and they interviewed me and they were like, we really like you. Um, and I got the internship as an undergrad and I continued working with them throughout the rest of my education. Um, and so at that same time, I was also working on what's called a 401, which is where you do uh, your master's degree and your undergraduate degree at the, at the same time for the last year. Um, 
it was not a four one for me. It was a uh, like five and a half one. Uh, we spent a spent a year and a half just kind of fumbling around doing our best um, <laughs> and not making much progress. Um, and I was doing the four one with a professor, Dr. Vasic, in the computer science department, who's no longer in the computer science department, um, on blockchain technology, which is what I work on in my day job now. Um, and we had a really good relationship until she left UNM to move to London, where she wanted me to move. And I didn't want to move internationally because I had a really good gig here with the United States government, and they don't want you to move internationally. <laughs> um, and so we ended up having to sort of break off our advisor relationship at in the middle of my master's degree and I was writing a thesis and I was writing a thesis with her <laughs> um and thankfully the co-chair of the computer science department um sort of took me under his wing and was like you've done all of the research for this you've, you've done all of the things you need to do you just have to write a paper and like I can read a technical paper um and so I really lucked out because I know a lot of people, if their advisor leaves, they end up having to start over. Um, and I that just wouldn't have worked for me because school was always really hard. Uh, and graduate school was even worse for the first bit because I was taking a lot of very math heavy classes. And as you may have guessed from the calculus story, math and I have a history uh, and they were extremely stressful. Um, for no reason, uh, when I took the last math class, the last like computer science theory class that I took, I didn't know if I passed as I was walking across the stage to graduate and the professor was smiling at me and shaking my hand. Um, and at the end I was like, hey bro, uh, did I actually graduate when I walked across that stage or is this all a lie? <laughs> um, and he was like, oh, you passed. And I was like, your grading system makes no sense. I had like a, like a, like a 45. What are you talking about? Um, so yeah. But now that, that kind of comes to a good end. So I worked with the co-chair as my advisor for the last year of my graduate degree. I wrote a paper under him. Um, we, I defended it like four days before the deadline for submitting it to the library because I uh, was sick for like three weeks before I defended um, and just couldn't defend it and <laughs> couldn't defend or set up anything during that time. And so I finished in the nick of time to graduate in December 2020. And they also, uh, uh, I passed my thesis with distinction um, and now I uh, have a job at Sandia working on what I worked on in my thesis. I got funding from Sandia National Labs to further research what I was researching. And that's what I've been doing for the last like five months. So that's me. Thanks, Ashley. You're the best. Um, I'm sure everyone has questions that so we're going to come back to you with questions in a minute. Um, Rosario, please take it away. Tell us about your story. Thank you. Um, Ashley, thank you so much for speaking. That was, that was great. It was very stressful. <laughs> that was very stressful to listen to. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll have, I'll have questions for you, but I'll, I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is Rosario Marroquin Flores. Um, I'm currently a PhD candidate at Illinois State University. Um, I was uh, born and raised in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, so I also did my undergraduate program there. Um, for me, I, I mean, I, I did fine in school. It took me five years to graduate. Um, what I didn't realize as I was taking my classes was how important research is. And I apologize, I was in the biology department. Um, and I didn't realize how important research was going to be to getting into graduate school. And so I started to learn that, God, I want to say it's my fourth year, 
Um, I was starting to get pushed by people to do research. Essentially, this whole story is people pushing me to do things that I wasn't ready to do. And that's how I ended up where I am right now. Um, <laughs> so I applied for um, the McNair Scholars Program as an undergraduate, and I believe it was in 2014. I don't remember when it was, but I applied near the end of my, um, of my program. And I was really, I remember like interviewing and being like super sweaty and uncomfortable, but I ended up getting into the program and that was kind of my first exposure to research. So as part of that program, um, it's basically, if you guys are not familiar, it's a professional development program that helps undergraduates transition into graduate programs. Um, and so I worked for a little while in Dr. Seth Newsom's lab. Um, and so I worked there for a little bit collecting coyote scat samples. That was my first kind of exposure with, um, with like field work. And then um, people in the McNair program and Dr. Newsom helped me to apply for a, an REU. So that's research experiences for undergraduates. Um, and I was able to get into an REU and I was really excited about that. So I lived for a summer in San Diego and worked at um, UCSD and at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And I got to do research with sea turtles and it was super exciting and super fun. And I got to touch them. And um, that particular study was actually a skeletal chronology project where we were aging turtle bones and seeing, um, evaluating bycatch risk in a particular area. But uh, another part of that was field work where we got to catch sea turtles and it was amazing. So it was a really, really good introduction to research for me. Um, I got to collect data and analyze data and I presented research for the very first time at the SACNIS conference, which I'll talk about later. That's, um, again, if you're not familiar, that's Society Advancing Chicanos, Hispanics and Native Americans in Science. My very, very first presentation ever as an undergraduate. So um, for those of you who don't know, when you join the McNair program, they expect you to go directly into a PhD or graduate program right after. Um, I did not do that. <laughs> I was super, super nervous and really scared and I didn't think I could do it. I didn't think I was ready and so I did. Um, and instead I decided I was just gonna work for a while. By the time I graduated, I was actually pretty burnt out. I was tired of school. I wanted to work in science. I wanted to get a field job and I wanted to like be a wildlife biologist, but I didn't wanna do any school. I was burnt out, I was done with school. Um, but I had a really hard time getting a job because I didn't have a lot of research experience or a lot of field experience. So I had a really hard time landing a position. So I ended up back at the restaurant, working at restaurants. I worked for a while at a security company, like a native owned security company, did that for a while. In about five months out of school, I realized that I really needed to get back. Um, this wasn't working for me. I was super bored. I didn't like what I was doing. I more, really, I was just so bored. You know, I think you get so used to being stimulated um, when you're in school that it took a step away and everything was just so boring. Um, so I knew I needed to get back, but I didn't really know how to get there because I, I still wasn't ready to apply for a graduate program. I still didn't know what the hell I was doing. I still didn't really have that much work experience um, in terms of like field work or biology work. Um, so what I did is I reached out to one of my favorite professors as an undergraduate, and that's how I ended up working in Dr. Chris Witt's lab. I basically emailed him and begged him for a job. <laughs> um, I just said, I, like, this is the situation. I'm gonna quit my job. I hate everything, please hire me. Um, and he was nice enough to bring me on. Although his, um, his was conditional. He said, yes, okay, I'll bring you into my lab but you have to apply for the UNM prep program, which is the post-baccalaureate research education program on campus. And similar to my experience with the Binaire program, I was really nervous about that. And I didn't really want to apply because I didn't think I was ready, but he just pushed me and he said, all right, you can work here, but you have to apply for this program. So he helped me to apply for the program and that's why I ended up in a post bath program. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, these are programs like one to two year programs for undergrad for like after you've graduated with your bachelor's and they help prepare you for graduate programs. So it's kind of like a mini masters. So um, I did that for a year and I worked in Chris's lab and we studied hemosporidian parasites and birds. And I learned a lot of skills in the lab in terms of like molecular skills, 
Uh, he taught me how to shoot a gun. That was cool. Taught me how to prep birds. Um, <laughs> so I really gained a lot of experience. Um, I was the first, first author on a paper that came out of that work. I got to present that research. It was huge. It was huge in terms of preparing me for graduate school, in terms of helping me figure out what type of research I wanted to do. And, um, you know, the professional development component of that also like helped me learn how to reach out to faculty and how to talk to people. And so all of it ended up being super important. So by the time I graduated, I was leaving that program, I felt like I was ready to apply for schools and I was ready to do it. And that's how I ended up at Illinois State University. Um, and I was just really excited. So I think that when I started my undergraduate program, my goal was to get into a graduate program. My goal was just to like get a doctoral degree because that's no one in my family has ever done that before. So that was an initial goal. It took a while for me to actually get into a program. However, when I actually got into the program, my goal was just getting in. So once I got in, I was like, now what do I do? <laughs> um, so then I had to like, you know, start to get the research and start to figure that out and start to navigate the landscape. I felt really good about the program that I'm in. I still feel great about the program that I am. I really like my department. I'm in a biology program. Um, I get along well with my advisors most of the time. <laughs> um, I have a great relationship with my lab mates. Um, everything is great. So when I got in, I was really happy with my choice. One thing that I was not prepared for and that I didn't really think about during the application process was, um, the culture shock that I was going to experience upon moving to Illinois. Having been born and raised in New Mexico, we're a minority majority state, there's culture everywhere, there's native people, um, I was close to family. Um, everything was really different when I moved to Illinois and I really just was not prepared for that. Um, it hit me pretty hard. I wasn't prepared for the community that I was interacting with. Um, the culture was really different. The people were really different. The food was really different. The way people interacted with each other was different. Um, and I'm sure that you guys are familiar, as you go up in academia, it gets like more and more white. Um, I knew that in New Mexico because at UNM, that is also a thing. It's worse out here. Um, and I just hadn't prepared myself for that. So the first like four or five months, I really struggled. Um, I had a really hard time just because I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere and I didn't know how to talk to people. And I just didn't like, I didn't have a space that I owned that was mine, I guess, in the community that I was working in. And so that was really hard. And so that's kind of where sadness comes back in. Um, when I did my work in Chris's lab, um, I had already applied to present my research at Sackness. So that fall, my first fall in my graduate program, I went to Sackness and I presented my research there. And when I went there, it was like a breath of fresh air. It was like, I was so, I didn't, I don't think I realized how bad it was until I went to Sackness and just like could breathe again and could talk to people and could just be open. And I could talk to people about what I was experiencing um, and they could give me feedback and help me work through stuff. So that ended up being really important. Additionally, um, in that same semester, I applied for the Yale CNC Academy, which is a professional development program for um, people who are from underrepresented backgrounds or who are from underrepresented communities in kind of the biomedical sciences. And so it's kind of, um, it's like does, they do professional development, they do networking, um, but they also do a lot of community building. And so in that, particular community, I was able to talk about the experiences that I was having and was able to communicate with a group of people um, who really felt the same way. They were from all over the place, had gone to these universities and kind of got ripped from their culture and placed in this weird environment. And so that ended up being super helpful for me to basically find a community that I could fit in with and that I could feel safe with. And that ended up kind of getting me through that first year. The following year, I ended up presenting again at Sackness, and the exact same thing happened. It was just like really great. I felt so good after being there. It's like kind of reset me for like the next year. Um, so at, at that second conference, I realized that I wanted to build a space like that at my university. 
there was another woman who was in the, the El Ciencia Academy with me. And um, we became kind of accountability buddies. And we both helped each other to build SACNIS chapters at our individual institutions. So we would check in with each other and share um, like proposals and share documents and stuff. And um, I was able to create a SACNIS chapter at ISU. It's not an official one because there's so much paperwork, but it's, it's an unofficial SACNIS chapter. <laughs> it's a registered student organization. Um, and it's been going really well. Um, the university likes what we're doing. Um, we've been really, really fortunate in terms of securing funding. We were able to send five students to the SACMIS conference in Hawaii um, a couple years ago. That was the best. It was so fun. Um, we were able to send, uh, we got enough funding to send 10 people to the conference last year, but of course everything changed. We ended up with eight students at the virtual conference. Um, and we're applying, we you know applied for more funds to send people to the conference this year in October, hopefully we get it. Um, but this whole process and like starting the SACMIS chapter, even though like the community that I'm working in is not super diverse, and yes, there are people from like diverse backgrounds who end up um, in our SACMIS group. It's more so that I've found a way to establish a community for myself and that people can also be a part of. So like the people who have similar wants and needs just kind of gravitate to the space that I've created. And now I have a community of people that I could have these conversations with. Um, so I'm really happy with how things have been going. Um, in terms of research, things don't always go the way I want them to go. But in terms of the community, I think that um, things are going pretty well here at ISU. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Rosario. That was incredible. You and Ashley, you guys are just like total badasses. As is the theme of our homegrown scientist speaker series. So thank you. Um, I'm sure that some people have some questions and we can kind of open up the floor for a sort of a discussion, Q&A for the speakers. Um, feel free to, to go ahead. I have questions for uh, Ashley. Uh, so now that I'm getting towards uh, finishing the master's degree in CS, I'm starting to think of like how to build experience in the field uh, that is still maybe like internship role, but gives me the freedom to still be in lab when I need to be in lab. Um, because I don't have the experience that I do like at the bench. And so how do you uh, like you said, you you saw the the posting and you didn't you said you didn't qualify, which I don't believe. <laughs> but I really don't like there are languages that I've never no, heard. No, no, of. no, Randy. I promise you, I didn't <laughs> qualify. Okay. I was a sophomore computer science student. They were asking for somebody with like machine learning knowledge with like particular software that I had no idea what that was, and I was just like, I could do machine learning. I'm pretty sure. And then I got the job and I have yet to do machine learning um, the whole time. I got the job, my boss like asked me in my interview, like, do you know what blockchain is? And I was like, oh yeah, like we have a professor that does blockchain at, sand at UNM. It was basic and she's not there anymore. Um, <laughs> and like I did, I did like some data generation for machine learning for like three months. And then I just didn't do it anymore. And then I just did blockchain stuff, but I did not qualify based on the posting. Okay. And like legit, just a, like, it's a little late for like summer internships this year because oh, yeah. of April, but like just apply to anything. It, like, this is like Sandia advice from me because that's where I applied to, but this works anywhere. Apply for anything. Okay. You're one, you're a woman in computer science. And so like already, because of like actions at a lot of companies, you, they have to put a certain amount of women into the interview. And like, once you interview, you're going to get the job. You're, you're a great communicator. Thanks. What about technical interviews? Do they do that to interns? Uh, not in my experience. Okay. Um, so I've hired, I'm hiring one summer intern uh, this year. 
Um, actually, I'm hiring one summer intern and then we just hired three year round interns. Um, oh, nice. We didn't do any particular like technical interview. We just did like a, what's your, we did like this 15 minute talk. Like, what's your experience? What's your life like? What have you struggled with? Like doing so, like a lot of, uh, all of the interviews that I've, I've sat on panels for, as well as the interviews that I've done have been like this. Um, now, if you like became staff at Sandia, you have, I transitioned from an intern. <laughs> But like I gave like a technical presentation on like what I've been doing, but like nobody was like solve this algorithm on a whiteboard in 10 minutes. Um, a lot of technical companies are moving farther away from doing that now because we've just found that it, I, what I feel now that I'm like looking for interns and looking for other people to work with and like hiring people, I would rather you not know anything that I'm doing and be able to communicate with me that you don't know what I'm doing and that you want to learn, then have you know what you're doing, but you be an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> and also I will say that like, you're talking specifically about wanting to still be able to work in the lab. Um, if you were to do like a year round internship at Sandia in particular, like you only have to work 10 hours a month. Oh, wow. Uh, to keep your internship. Now, if you do that over the summer, someone's gonna look at you weird <laughs> um but like during the school year that's that's completely reasonable and most people don't care awesome thank you yeah. that makes me feel better for not having all of the skills that I see listed <laughs> oh no one has all the skills that they list okay. because they so like when I write internship post postings what I'm doing is I'm writing like if you have anything on this list great <laughs> um, awesome because like I want somebody who like either knows Python or like C or Java like I don't need somebody who knows all three I want somebody who knows how to program in any language because then they can learn what I'm doing specifically okay cool thank you yeah I I wanted to say one more thing Ashley I I tried just texting this to you but uh I wanted to mention as well that since Ashley's talking about um you know caring more about uh your your personality and your character than uh some of your more technical skills that that goes way up the more flexibility and the longer term the posting you're looking for is um so really especially when you're looking for something that's like I want to be able to go back to the bench uh you know if I need to especially in that situation you should be applying to a lot of places and just you know see who you like working for and see who likes you okay cool yeah because my uh Dr. Lakin he is he lets me go into the lab whenever I want so I go in the middle of the night because I can park on campus <laughs> So that's that's usually when I'm there. Thanks, Thomas. I have, I have a question for Rosario um, about like when you were talking about transitioning, the culture shock of transitioning out of Albuquerque into Illinois. You said, oh, I'm trying to think of your words exactly. You said I didn't prepare myself for that, which I thought was interesting that you say it that way because you kind of imply that there's, you maybe feel like you should have done something different. And I, I just, it struck me because I think for one, I don't know, is there something more you could have done? But like, I'm just curious what your advice is on that topic specifically, because re regardless of somebody here who's in that situation or might be in that situation eventually, or maybe somebody who's listening to the recording, devices for because I think that's a very common situation that people from New Mexico go to UNM and then for the first time ever for graduate school move outside of the state so tell me what you think yeah so I don't <laughs> I didn't realize that it phrased I phrased it that way but um I don't really know that there is a way to prepare for that um I think the only way is to kind of find a way to insulate yourself from those effects. So I think I might've phrased it that way because 
you know, even at UNM, you, you do see these transitions as you get into higher academia, that it gets wider, kind of the higher you go up. So I guess perhaps that's why I was thinking about it that way, you know, retroactively. But um, I don't think that there is really a way to prepare yourself for that. I think part of it is just making sure that you find a community that you can interact with and someone that you can share these experiences with, even if it's not like an on-campus community, you know, like I said, I connected with these other programs where I was able to share experiences with people who were in similar situations. So even just having someone to commiserate with or to who could talk about their own experiences and what they've been through. So yeah, I don't know that you can necessarily prepare if you're you know, born and raised in one place and then you're suddenly moving to another place. But I think that if you can find people to talk to and you can build a community where you are, then that will kind of help you deal with that. Yeah, I kind of dealt with the same thing when I moved to New Mexico. I was born and raised in Oklahoma and I maybe left the state of Oklahoma before I moved to New Mexico like six times. Um, and like five of those times were to go to Texas, um, which is basically the same place. Um, and definitely like the thing that I think helped me succeed in like transitioning to UNM from Oklahoma was, was exactly what Rosario was saying. Like I immediately like was like, okay, I have to find a group of people cause I don't know anybody here. I don't know how these people talk to each other. Like the first time that I, like I was like doing something outside and I like parked my car and I like asked somebody like, Hey, do you need like uh do you need me to like move so you can get out easier and they just were like what the fuck are you doing talking to me uh <laughs> because like I'm from a very small town everybody knows everybody like I could go to Walmart and just be like oh I'm in Walmart for six hours because I saw 17 different people who are friends with me or somebody I'm with um and like that was a big change for me and so like my first like group was working with the uh I was with like the LGBTQ like resource center um people and then that like transitioned to they were like hey do you have like a gay person who can come talk at this thing uh and they were like yeah Ashley is a scientist she can do that uh and then that landed to somebody in AWS was at that talk and then they dragged me over here um <laughs> and so like so yeah, I, I, I completely agree that like just be lining to find a community, even if it's not like the community that you are going to be with the whole time, um, just finding somebody who you can relate to from the get-go. Because I was also in, I was in electrical engineering and computer science, which are um, maybe some of the more male-dominated fields still in the, uh, in the universe. <laughs> um, and so... <laughs> I also, there, there just wasn't, there wasn't a lot of diversity in the fields that I was in, like in my classes. And so finding other people was really important because I just don't really relate to like white dudes that much. Oh, you're so funny. <laughs> I, I wanted to echo what Rosario said as well about finding community. And I think that was an error that I made um, because I, always was born and raised in Albuquerque and I knew so many people and I felt so comfortable there. I knew what to expect. Ah, there's a plane going by. Um, uh, so when I moved, I just assumed like, and I'm an extrovert. So I just assumed like, I'm going to make friends, but I didn't. And I found myself telling my family and friends, like the people, the only people I feel comfortable talking to are the people who work in the kitchen and the maintenance crew at my school. Those are my friends now. And I still wasn't like naming it. I just was like, I feel really comfortable chatting with them. Like we have good conversation, we laugh, you know, but I'm not finding that with my colleagues. And so like it all came crashing down and then I had like a hardship happen in my life and I was alone. Um, and so I think looking back, like that's what I say now is, is like, it's gotta be priority one before figuring out your textbook or your classes, like find community, <laughs> definitely. Can I go again? <laughs> um, Ashley, I wish I could give you a hug because 
listening to you talk about calculus. So that's my story for physics. Um, and I only passed calculus because I had an amazing study group that like propped me up and was like, okay, get to that board. We will stay here all night. We are going to help you figure this out and get ready for that exam. Uh, and that was really helpful, but that's like how I passed physics. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There you go. I didn't have it for physics. I didn't have anybody. So I just went to office hours and didn't help. <laughs> um, all the time that I've known you, which I think is three years now, maybe um, this whole time, I've just been like me, Ashley, <laughs> she's like a super brain. <laughs> and so I'm so grateful for you to share your story today because I feel more connected to you where before, like I knew you were a computer science major and I was just like, whoa, she's like super smart. And of course you are super smart, you're brilliant and you're hilarious, but like, I really appreciate you sharing your experience about your calculus classes and um, applying for the job and like not feeling qualified, but doing it anyway. Like it's, that really touches me. So thank you. Yeah, um, now the calculus thing is like a thing that I don't talk about a lot. Um, but it it really was like it was the thing and like Thomas can tell you for years it was the thing that like I could do really well in any other class and I would be like well but the thing is is I'm not good at math so I'm not going to succeed um and it's not even really that I was bad at math it was really that like the education system was not set up for me to learn math because the second I got into a class with a teacher who was like oh like people learn differently like people retain information differently I had a hundred percent in both my calculus classes, like the, the second that happened. Um, and, and I think like, I think that's true for most people who struggle with calculus or with any other like hard technical subject. A lot of it is professors who are like, I'm not gonna help you because if you can't learn this on your own, you can't do it. And I don't, I, I don't think that's fair or right. <laughs> um, but it is like the unfortunate reality that we live in. Um, so I felt that I, I did felt like it was important to share here. Yeah. Because well, I feel like a lot of people can relate to having failed a class, not due to, uh, not necessarily due to your intelligence, but due to uh, just form. not having the support system that you need. Right. Yeah, I, I just finished a four day exam, which is part of my PhD program. And I told my advisor, like, each committee member wrote me a question and two of them were their coding, and they're quantitative. So I had to like, I had to like, come up with an equation, a partial differential equation, and then turn it into a model in, in, co in my code, and then run it and see how it goes, blah, blah, blah. And so like, I, I know that I, I know I didn't do it right. But I haven't, I haven't heard back from the committee yet, but um, listening to you, I was remembering like, even if I don't pass this and I have to do it again, it doesn't mean that I have failed and it doesn't mean I get don't get to do what I want to do. So thank you for saying that because that's gonna stick with me. It's gonna be another month before I hear if I passed or not. Um, and even when I told my advisor, like I've prepared myself to not pass and I have to take it again in the fall. It doesn't mean I'm gonna quit grad school. It doesn't mean I'm a failure. I'm still gonna talk about that I failed or that I didn't pass the exam. And she was just like, well, I don't wanna talk about like that. Like, that's not an option, like you have to pass. And I was like, why? Like, is, the, is, is it gonna look bad on you if I don't pass? You know, like really just like, let's name what's happening right here. But anyway, it, ha it really has been hitting me pretty hard. So thank you again for what you said today. Yeah, that, that particular story really hit me too. <laughs> I, was, I was really just impressed that you were able to keep going and move past that. Cause I have to say, I'm not much of a crier, but math and physics always seem to make me cry. Like I used to cry all the time when I was taking physics classes cause it was just so hard. And then, you know, biostats always makes me cry. And now I'm in advanced biostats and that makes me cry. So like, I'm just really impressed that you were able to deal with that and then just like bounce back. So I'm, oh. yeah, this is a really good story. Or recover. <laughs> I, I want to make it clear. I cried a lot. <laughs> um, I, even, even math classes later, I was like so traumatized by calculus that like, 
I took like my grad, like the graduate class, like the professor, like didn't tell me I passed until after I walked across the stage. I took, I cried like every week in that class. Every time a homework was due, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I am an idiot. I can't be a computer scientist. And then Thomas, who was here, would be like, well, I mean, you, you got this far uh, and you're passing and not everyone can say that. So like, I think you're probably fine. Um, but also like, I'm a big proponent of like, you can fail uh, as many times as the program will let you. And uh, it doesn't matter as long as you uh, succeed in the end. <laughs> so you can fail that four day exam. I have another question. Um, Rosara, you mentioned this and Ashley, maybe you have something to say on it too, but uh, you mentioned that you're the first person in your family to do a PhD. And I, I'm just like, I, we, we've heard some stories from other speakers in the series and I'm just like interested to know what like your sort of situation is with your family in terms of like support and like how your relationship with them has changed as you've kind of like gone down a different path that I don't know, like some people, I guess, have, have sort of described like their family not being able to relate to them quite as much um, or kind of having to defend their decisions, you know, so I'm curious to know how you've navigated that situation. Um, and Ashley, I'm not sure, but you could, maybe you can touch on that too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I watched some of the old um, AWS talks and I was like, oh my God. That's so different. <laughs> like, that'd be so much to deal with. My um, my parents have been very supportive, um, and they've been as then they've been. When I was an undergraduate, they pushed me a lot, um, especially my dad. He really pushed me to do well in school. Probably a little too much pressure sometimes, but <laughs> he pushed me really hard when I was in high school, when I was an undergrad. Um, but there has been uh, a bit of a shift, not in terms of, of, you know, support. My parents have both been very supportive kind of this entire time. There are, hmm, there are some cultural things that are hard sometimes. I think that um, they chose to move to New Mexico for a reason. And for a long time, I think that they were worried that I wasn't safe. I think they still worry that I'm not safe, that I'm not safe here. Um, my, my partner is from Tennessee, um, that I'm not safe there. So there are some issues with that that come up. Um, but then there, there's also an interesting shift in how we interact because when I was younger, you know, you look up to your parents, you listen to everything that they say. Um, even when I was much older, I would always listen to what my parents had to say because they were right and they're my parents and they are knowledgeable. And it's really interesting now to interact with my parents and have them ask me questions. That's been a really interesting shift that I wasn't, I guess, just prepared for. It just, you grow up and you have this dynamic with your, with your parents. And I remember, um, you know, with the COVID stuff, like talking to my parents about like what was going on and how it works and then how the vaccine works. And I didn't expect vaccine hesitancy, but there was some. And so we had to talk about that. And I, you know, things that I just wasn't, I didn't realize. Um, so there, there have been shifts in our relationships. They're, they're still super supportive. They still worry about me probably too much. Um, but it's, there has been a shift in how we interact because now they're asking me questions, which, which is new. <laughs> um, where did your parents move from? To, oh. to New Mexico, you said? Yeah, so my parents both grew up in really small towns in Ohio. So Lorraine, Ohio and Defiance, Ohio. Okay. So they also, um, they experienced a lot of racism growing up yeah. and have a lot of negative emotions and experiences toward the Midwest. And yeah. so when they moved to New Mexico, it was very intentional move. So sure. when I moved back to the Midwest. Um, yeah, they're was, like, what are you doing? <laughs> no. Strongly discouraged. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, I was uh, I was kind of a first generation college student. Um, my mom had started college two years before I did, um, and she was getting a degree in 
uh, early childhood, early childhood education. And my dad, um, never, um, never went to co- or never graduated college. He went to college to be an engineer for about a year and then did not do the thing that I did and was like, I failed calculus and I'm going to do it again. Uh, and just failed calculus and then dropped out, which again is why I think making the math part, making math the way it is, is bad. Um, and I think the thing that is different now, um, and this is kind of like a little bit of a, of, a, of a long thing, but like, so when I graduated high school, everybody in my family was like, Ashley's really smart. Ashley's really intelligent. Ashley is going to go really far. Um, and then I just fucking crashed and burned for two straight years. Um, like I did not get into the depths of the crashing and burning. Like I did fail calculus. I also uh, failed my second computer science class that I ever took. Uh, I didn't really get how to program. I didn't, I had to retake digital logic and design. I barely passed both of my physics classes. Like I just was on a road straight to uh, failing. Uh, when I transferred to UNM, my GPA was a nice 2.46. Um, and people who know me now look at, uh, hear that number and they're like, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't fit with the Ashley I know. And that's because the Ashley you know figured out how to get her shit together when she moved to UNM and got to restart because UNM throws out your old GPA. Um, <laughs> But so when I like crashed, my parent, my mom and my grandparents uh, on her side were very like concerned, um, very much like let off the pressure and was like, you can come home, you can give up, like that's fine. My dad, who is the person who sort of failed, um, and this might be trigger warning, like my dad had cancer um, and it affected like his ability to process information. Um, um, but my dad like was very like stressed about me not doing well um, and very stressed about like me not doing well in engineering in specific um, and like was kind of like grumpy about that and like I don't know if that is because of his own feelings or because like of the brain cancer um, and so like that was kind of the relationship there. And then when I moved to UNM and started doing really well, my maternal family was still kind of like, well, you know, we were really upset about you moving to Albuquerque because we've heard it's a crime place. Uh, secret, Albuquerque and my hometown have the same like crime, violent crime level per capita. Uh, so like I, there was no increase in danger, <laughs> uh, but they sure thought there was. Um, but they were like, you know, we didn't want you to move, but like, you're doing, you're doing much better, but like, we're not going to put pressure on. And my dad was like, just really, really, really excited. Um, and I felt really supported for the whole time from different viewpoints. Um, of when I graduated, my dad and everybody came down for my undergraduate graduation, which was right before COVID hit. Um, and then like, I did my last year of my master's degree during COVID. Um, and then like I, once I graduated and then I was getting my master's degree, pretty much everybody in my family was a little confused because they didn't know what grad school was. Uh, they didn't know why I needed to go to grad school. They didn't really know what I was doing because when you don't know how to use a computer, it's really hard to explain how distributed systems operations research, um, what that is. <laughs> Um, my grandfather thinks I work on like Amazon Nest. <laughs> um, but then uh, in June, midway through, my dad passed away. Um, and then everyone the last semester was really like overwhelming um, because they all wanted to make sure that like I was gonna finish because they were like we don't know what this is and we don't know what it means for you to finish but it seems really important to you and we've seen you crash before and you can't <laughs> um, not in like a very demeaning way like if I had crashed they would have been fine but like they were very much like you will make it and we will make it through <laughs> um, 
And now I have a job and I make money and they're very excited about that. I make the most money of anybody in my entire family. Uh, most of the households in my family, I make more money than they do combined. Um, and so they're like, you know, I don't know what you do, but like it, it worked out. <laughs> um, I grew up very, very poor. And so the reason I went to college was to make money. Uh, I didn't have like a, I'm going to get a grad degree because that's how I'm going to do really cool work. I had, I'm going to get a grad degree because if I get a grad degree, I can make more money at my job than what I can make as a bachelor's. <laughs> um, and so like, that was, now that I've graduated, they're all still like, I don't know what you're doing. Um, but everybody's really excited to have me talk to their young kids about science. Um, so like my, uh, my stepmother, I talk to my half brother a lot. Uh, and I talk to my sibling, my, my mom's uh, stepchildren uh, a lot because they're like, well, you could, you could inspire them to do that. And I'm like, I don't know if I really want to push anybody to go through what I went through. Um, but I can tell them it was, uh, I can tell them what it was. Um, and so like their relationship with like what I do and who I am has like really ebbed and flowed throughout my entire education, depending on like what's going on. Um, and a lot of it still is like, we support you and we have no idea what it is you do. We all, we all teach uh, middle school. We have three minutes left and I think we need to call it at 4.30 on the dot. So if we have, we probably have time for like one more very brief question if there is one. Can we have a sentimental moment about the series? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can it you was so that? good. Because, uh, <laughs> you're good at that, Holly. You do that. <laughs> well, it's been life-changing for me and I think for all of us um this is like no matter what's been going on in my life I'm like nope I will not be there I have some place to be and I did not want to miss and I'm very sorry I was late today I was on a phone call that was just I couldn't get off of it but anyway um this has just been really phenomenal and I support continuing it I can help organize um and reach out and find speakers at UNM I just really think it, that this has been this has touched my heart uh, and I'm really grateful for, for the opportunity to get to know all of the speakers in the series because most of them I didn't know before. Mm -hmm. Me too, actually. I've loved getting to know everybody. It's been like beyond what I imagined. Um, oh yeah, when grateful. you first contacted me about the idea, I was like, that sounds like it could be a fun thing to do in COVID. And now I'm like, yeah, no, we have to do this forever. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, get scheming for round two coming at you next year. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're right, Holly, like on a final note, just I, I cannot express my gratitude enough. It's It's been totally enriching. And I feel very privileged to have been able to just listen and, and engage with everybody and, and have everybody give me their time incredible yeah all right also, it is Randy, if you need so help getting internships just text me <laughs> <laughs>